this is video number two. Um, this will be the first one in my physical um, video collection um, about my physical health. And this will be going into um, my rare genetic disorder. So basically, my granddad, my mum and myself um, have a rare genetic disorder called MED. It's also often referred to in the US as Fairbank. Um, but what MED stands for is the acronym stands for multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. So what that means is it affects multiple joints. Um, the epiphyseal is the end of the, the, the long bone, so the, the round part and usually the, the cut. Um, and it affects, um, it can also affect, and it does in my case, um, my spine. So um, basically what it, what it means is, is that um, when your bones are growing, um, they put down cartilage, which then um, hardens um, the bone. It's called the process of ossification. Um, in people with MED, that process is defective. So it does it in random Ball, um, and a cut that it, you, you can use and it moves around properly and smoothly. Um, people with MED to varying degrees, depending on whether you have dominant or recessive. I have the dominant version. Um, the recessive version um, that has different features. Um, and I'm not saying it's, it's better than or worse. Um, the dominant version does seem to affect more um, and can be done, uh, you can usually affect people to a, a, a higher degree. Um, but the recessive version also comes with different aspects that can affect people in a different way. Um, I have the, the dominant version, my mum has the dominant version, and so does my granddad. It has not missed a generation. Um, I'm not sure where my granddad got it from when he was born, but um, it also, as it's, um, uh, as it's, you get it through the generations, it also seems to um, make you shorter. Um, a, a few, or I've seen um, it being referred to as in a quadriplegia, which means a, a type of autism. I myself am. Um, My granddad was or is five foot five. Um, so as you can see, it's definitely making us shorter as we go down the line of, of inheritance. Um, so, MED, um, there is no cure for it. Um, it is affecting um, bones. Um, the, the only issue, the only way of sorting out any issues with your bones, um, especially with your so, um, I, I had a child, um, and during my pregnancy I was monitored very closely, um, and I also opted to have genetic testing done. Now with my genetic testing, um, out of 100% of people that have MED, as it's rare and there just isn't the money into looking into these things, I unfortunately um, was in the, in the rarer 25% that they have not found the mutation in my DNA, which unfortunately meant that I do not know whether my daughter has got it. However, I was diagnosed, however, incorrectly um, at nine months with Parkinson's disease. And it wasn't until we moved down south that I ended up seeing a specialist and we all got diagnosed with MED, which is what we actually have. Now, um, my MED, um, unfortunately, it affects my spine. I also have a thing called Sherman's, which means that my um, spinal columns are wedge shaped. Um, and also, I've got um, a degenerative. 
um, changes in my spine. I've got them in my knees. I've had my hip replaced. Um, it's coming back about four years ago now. I was very young to be having that done, and it took a lot of fighting to get it done. Um, so I have been to many different doctors and 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 people. Um, We couldn't have my daughter genetically tested. So, luckily... It looks like um, she does not have it. As they couldn't find the reason that I have it, they said you have to assume that the inheritance is as high as 50-50. So it's a flip of a coin. And that was the same for me. like my daughter has not inherited it she's been seen by multiple doctors and had x-rays from when she was a tiny baby she had um, ultrasounds done and then she started having x-rays done and from when she got to two and um, they turned around and said that they were pretty happy that it looks like she has not inherited it but they were always welcoming her back to, to, to be checked if she's got any concerns now, by, by the time I was her age, she was now five, I showed a lot of signs. I was exceptionally short. Um, because my spine is affected, it curves in several different ways. So my spine comes down, but it also curves right out, but it also curves to the side as well. Um, it's called hyposcoliosis, I think. I'm not sure whether I pronounced that correctly. But that's what I was told on top of all the other things that I've got. So um, I was diagnosed or they knew that I had something wrong at, as early as nine months. Um, but with my daughter, she is fine. I had, as I was growing, I had things like uh, I was not kneed. I um, had issues with flat feet, which is very common. common in people with MED, um, and I also, um, I had issues with my spine, um, and I, I was exceptionally short. So it was quite evident that there was something wrong, whereas my daughter looks to be completely fine, which is great. Um, as I was having her, and the inheritance is as high as 50, 50 and I was affected. Um, unfortunately, um, I decided to, um, I, when I was pregnant with her, I, I, I suffered quite badly. I had horrific morning sickness and I lost over two odd stone and considering I was only eight stone at the time, I got exceptionally small and I was constantly in the hospital. So what they did is, um, they, they eventually, um, got me to one, one day off of 38 weeks. And I had a by cesarean because of the effect, how my MED affects my spine. Um, I managed to um, get them to agree to give me a general because there was a large chance that an epidural or a spinal was not going to work with my spine. Um, it could, they could have done it and it could have not worked anyway, and then I would have ended up having to have a general anyway. So I decided an option to have a general. Now, as they were telling me that my inheritance is as high as 50-50, and we had no idea whether Sylvia was going to have it at that time or not, um, I decided to ask and opt to be sterilised, which is exceptionally uncommon, um, and it took a lot of, um, uh, not arguing and fighting, it just took a lot of reassuring that I knew I was the decision I was making and, the, and that it was right for me. I ended up having to see, I think it was two or three different GPs and I had to explain to them my reasoning for it, which was, you know, I am a disabled mother. Um, I do not know whether Sylvia's going to have it. I don't know whether she's going to have it as bad as I've got it. 
and if she does, you know, or we choose to have any other children, they could also inherit it to a, to a greater or lesser degree, or not at all. Um, so I just decided to um, only have the one and put all of my attention into her. Um, and make sure that she was going to be fine. So eventually that they did agree to um, sterilise me, so I had tubal lice cut the tubes and then they fold them over and then they stitch them or staple them I think they stitch them in my case so that was um, that was it so there is going to be no more children um, so hopefully um, Sylvia as she grows up and progresses she's up an average height she's um, got no issues so far that we can see um, but I will I'm, I'm gonna keep monitoring her get a little bit not need and uh, make sure that she's going to be okay and so after I um, had all that done uh, a year later after I had Sylvia um, my hip um, now my right hip was more affected than my left hip so um, it, basically what I had was when they x-rayed it and just like followed it on and checked um, where my hip cup, which is called the acetabular cup, and where the um, actual ball sits in it and moves around, mine was exceptionally shallow. I, I basically didn't have one. And the top round part of the ball was actually muscle shaped with lots of light like, bits coming off of it, um, which meant that lots of little bits of bone hip joints and things like that so and when I after I had Sylvia I, I my hip especially my right one just started dislocating and just would flop out of place and my leg wouldn't move and then I'd fall over and going around you know on your own when you're on maternity leave with a you know a, a, a newborn or a three months old it, w it was getting impossible to actually do anything and I was having so many accidents so once I got her she was just um, I think it, she was just under or just over a year they agreed to have me in and they replaced my hip I have a hip that's um, a, a Johnson & Johnson hip which is a, a metal and plastic so it's got a metal stem it is not cemented in. What it is is it's hollow and it's actually got my bone growing into it, which um, they're saying is actually better. Um, a lot of the medical cement, especially my mum, she's had an awful lot of things done. Um, the cement is very, very difficult to remove. Once you need them replaced, because hip replacements do not last a lifetime. Um, some people can be very lucky. My granddad has been very lucky and he's only had his hip replaced once. Um, he's had both done, but he, he's you know, not needed to have his redone. Um, so, you know, you can be very lucky, but most of the time I was given some my hip replacements um, that they were going to last from anywhere 5 to up to 20, maybe usually around 15 years. And then after that, I will need um, so hopefully it will be towards the end of the spectrum on, on that one. And um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's a Johnson & Johnson one. It is not metal on metal, which is a big issue. It is metal on plastic. So um, I had that done when my daughter was just coming up a year old. And um, it's been okay. It hasn't got rid of the issues entirely and unfortunately she was pain um i all of my joints are affected to a greater or lesser degree anyway and especially my spine so i um uh, i do use crutches and for going outside i use a wheelchair um mainly because also with my hip and my leg placement i was very not knee and also my leg my feet go out at like 10 to 2 so instead of walking completely straight so I know where my feet are going and I can see it my 
I do go out to the side, so I then bump into things, trip into, you know. Constantly fall over. So, as especially outside, that can cause a lot of issues, especially with joints not being formed properly. Dis had your hip replaced because that's a, a, a issue in and, in and of itself. Um, I will need more joints replaced as I go along. Um, I had my knees at the moment are the worst thing affected. I currently take painkillers. I'm on a painkilling patch which is a fentanyl patch. Um, the main reason Um, under control and, it, and it's just constant instead of having to wait for the painkillers to wear off and then take them again I, that is just constant and that patch lasts for three days and then I put another one on so I'm on um, I think it's just over 37 um which is MCCG, I think, which is like micro, like micro, micro doses an hour. Um, so I'm on that. I do also have um, clopidomol tablets as well, um, which I take for breakthrough pain um, throughout the day. I'm on a 30, 500, so 30 of, of, of codeine and 500 of, of paracetamol, and I take those as and when I need them uh, to add a bit of extra um, pain relief to keep me mobile. So if I do anything exceptionally physical, I can take those in preparation um, to give me a bit more of a boost. So um, those are the things I'm on for pain relief. I have tried many other things like gabapentin, um, or lots of lots of different other things. I've tried the boot cannon patch, um, but I've ne I've never really um, got on with those. And a lot of it is not um, nerve pain or muscular pain. A lot of it is actual bone pain. And with bone pain, it, it's it's actually more difficult. The the there really isn't much they can do other than replacing the joints or, or trying to fix them in, in whatever way. And with my spine, my spine being affected, unfortunately, there isn't much they can do with spines. And, and touching spines and operating on spines via an older specialist that I've seen, they have advised me really to leave it alone. Um, once you've touched your spine and, and had something done on it, if it doesn't really work, then you, you, you're just trying to fix something um, that, that's very difficult to fix. Um, it's one of those things that if you've, if you've got, got it, look after it. Um, and once it's been then interfered with, it can be very, very difficult to then go back. And with spines, um, the statistics that I've looked up, especially with, with them wanting to straighten my spine or do you can end up in more pain than what you were in if the operation doesn't go well. Um, so I would much rather at the moment correct be left alone, but it doesn't I mean that I am disabled and I, I have a lot of pain issues. And I, I take naps during the day to get me through it. I physically can't do as much. Um, and Um, carrying her around was really hard. Um, doing anything with her was exceptionally difficult. What I did um, is uh, I was lucky enough to be able to get a mobility car, and getting her in and out of the car was exceptionally difficult. She got, especially now, um, she got to the size that I, I just could not manage anymore. So what I did is um, I contacted mobility and they got me a lovely swivel car seat which meant that I could swivel it um, to the door and then she once she was old enough could climb into the seat I didn't have to pick her up 
and I, I eventually you know, stopped putting her up and, and putting the strain on my spine but as I get older it, 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 they're all going to get worse so the main thing that I'm struggling with at the moment is my knees um, with my knees um, they are the next thing that it sort of goes my, my hips were the worst my spine and then my knees now my knee um, I've had Three operations done in total. I've had one arthroscopy on my left and two on my right. And an arthroscopy is where it's keyhole surgery and they go in and they basically flush your knee out and they have a look round at the cartilage and the bone and everything to see what's in there. Now when I had my first one done they found out that I got an enormous tear in the cartilage in my knee which is why I felt something getting caught in it and it was so painful and it was swollen and it didn't look right and they've also found out that where my knee is um, because it's a joint it was affected by my MEG and so it's not formed right so um, I've had that uh, they took out a lot of cartilage with the tear and they also found that I had a what's called a plica which is an extra piece of cartilage which usually grows on the outside um, and so they remove that but they can grow that um, I then had it I had an arthroscopy done again on that right knee uh, because it was painful and they basically took a load of debris out because of with joints that are affected by MED you can get bony spurs that grow on them that when you're using your bones they can get knocked off or come off and then they can get caught in your knee joint and you just basically have all this debris floating around in your knee or any joint really hips, knees, shoulders and so they flushed out my knee and, and took out a bit more of my cartilage to the point now I've, I've got virtually no cartilage in my right knee which means that I just have bone on bone moving around which you can and pretty much guess is pretty uncomfortable and it's quite painful um, which is why I use crutches an awful lot I recently had steroid and painkiller injections into my knee joints and they worked really well I, I was really quite impressed at how well they worked the only downside is is I've also had them done in my spine um, trigger point injections done in the muscles down the side of my spine they don't for me personally last long enough they wear off usually within about three weeks and it takes up to two months to get another appointment and they said if they don't really last anywhere up to the two three month mark it's not worth doing because they have to do them themselves in the specialist clinic you can't really get them done anywhere else and they said that they're not really cost effective to carry on doing so i had it wore off especially in my right knee because my right side seems to be worse affected than most of my left and so um my right knee is, is pretty much gone back to the beginning now and so i'm waiting to They don't really want to do another arthroscopy. Um, they don't really see how that would help, especially as my knee just then gets worse. There is a possibility they'll do open knee surgery and maybe have a look at doing something, but I'm unsure as yet what they might do, um, or they might just turn around and say don't do anything at all. Um, I had multiple MRIs and things done on my leg, and I have a degenerative. Um, changes in my knee which basically means that my knee is wearing down um, and not formed quite right oh, it's wearing down because of the, the deformities of, of my knees so um, I have yet to find out what's going to happen with that one but I'll put up um, videos following all of that um, and anything with my spine or any changes I'm just going to follow them along um, so that was that's pretty much everything physically um, with 
my uh, MEG. It's unfortunately rare and it's unfortunately um, a lot of doctors can misdiagnose and it's also um, exceptionally difficult when you're young um, to get anything done. With the NHS being so stretched, don't really want to do um, many surgeries. Um, As I am so young and I have my hip replaced, I do go to follow up appointments every six to twelve months, mainly because I would be using my hip replacement more than someone who has them done when they're 60, 80, which is more common. So I do have my hips um, checked quite often and um, it's, it's been alright. Um, my left one doesn't seem to be as bad but unfortunately um, there never is no hip replacement is really ever going to be as good as your natural one unless your natural one is, is severely malformed. Like my, my right one was severely malformed but luckily I've managed to um, my hip replacement went really well. I didn't really have many issues or complications. Um, but unfortunately, they are not, um, they're not going to last you a lifetime. Depending on the age you have them done, the younger you have them done, they're not going to last uh, forever. Or you certainly have to be a lot more careful about how you, uh, what you do when, you're when you've had your hip replacement. As mine was not cemented in, I had to be a lot more careful than someone that, had, that, that has been cemented in. Now what that means is, um, I, with mine, mine was not cemented in, so it was basically just put into, into the bone shaft. They hollow out a piece of the bone, stick the um, shaft in, and then they wait for the bone to actually grow into it, which means it's not as stable as someone that has them cemented. Once the bone's grown into it, it's a lot better than having it cemented. But that takes time. And that's why um, when you, after you've had it done, especially if you don't have them cemented in, you have to be very careful. You can't cross your leg. You can't lift them over a certain height. You have to be very, very careful. But um, yeah, that's pretty much everything um, to do with that. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I was pregnant throughout um, most of um, my worst parts with my hips and things. So um, that was that was exceptionally difficult, and that's mainly why I opted or got as well as losing so much weight um but uh, yeah if you've got any